Friday here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. We've got Brian Batko on with us. We're going to talk about if the Steelers were to make a trade that included a player on their roster, who would it be and what would it be for? That and a lot more here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Brian Batko, one of our great Steelers writers at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. You can find all our written work at post-gazette.com, or you can find this show and all of our video and podcast content on your on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all the daily content that comes out here, including the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive podcast. As always, this show is brought to you by Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. When you go to Mike's Beer Bar, be, be sure to check them out because they have over 500 different available beers. Three of those beers are available are, are local and any of those, those local beers are available on tap we'll have more on mike's beer bar later brian the steelers have other moves to make this this, this offseason they still have to find a, a starting center you know I, I know that they've said that uh nate herbig could fill that role but they've even kind of acknowledged that's not that, that's a far-fetched situation as it is uh, you know you, you, you imagine they still want to upgrade a tackle they still would, would need a slot corner and they could definitely use upgrades at, at other positions as well maybe younger getting younger on the defensive line and with that there's only so many draft picks to go around and not all your draft picks it's even though you have four in the first three rounds this year not all your draft picks can become starters right away. I mean, we saw even first rounders like Broderick Jones and second rounders like Joey Porter Jr. took, you know, some weeks before they got on the field last year. If there is a player that they would, that if there are players that, that, that we could look at that the Steelers might be willing to move that could help them either get more capital or, or do some player swappings, who are the players on the Steelers roster right now that you look at as the most movable of the group? Well, I think there are obviously plenty of players who would garner a ton of interest around the league. And sometimes at the the depths of offseason mindless chatter, you hear things thrown out like, could they trade TJ Watt for a, a huge <laughs> amount? Could they trade Cam Hayward to a contender and, and recoup something because he's getting old? And, you know, even Alex Highsmith, I've been asked about in my mailbag this offseason, what, what would he fetch on the open market? Um, but I just don't think, any, you know, none of those moves are realistic to me. Maybe we should never say never in the Omar Khan era. But aside from, you know, obvious established all pro caliber guys, I think any trade you look to deal from a position of strength to help shore up a position of weakness. And one spot on the Steelers roster that that at least has depth from top to bottom is the defensive line. And you know, occasionally players who can have some value to other teams in, in trade talks or ones that had decent draft pedigree and good physical attributes, measurables, and just haven't panned out in the NFL. And, and what's been Mike Tomlin's, you know, phrase du jour this offseason, change of scenery. He said Kenny Pickett wanted it. Justin Fields wanted it. So sometimes that can help a guy too. And I look at the Steelers' D-line, kind of go down the list, DeMarvin Leal, third rounder a couple years ago, just has not panned yeah. out here through two seasons. A little bit injury induced, but I think more so just hasn't developed the way they want. I don't know if that's a work ethic deal. He was a healthy it. scratch for the last like month of the season. Right. Yeah. His rookie year, he was showing some flashes and then he got hurt. Mm -hmm. This past season, you know, early on in training camp, a couple days, I think there were issues with the heat for him. Mm -hmm. So conditioning became a a question mark. And yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it was a terrible finish to his second season at a time when the Steelers normally want to see any Mark draft pick, but, but especially a top three round draft pick start to ascend. Um, so that, that, that's one to me that I don't know what you could get for him. Every, you know, drawback that I just laid out with the Marvin Leal is something that other teams and their scouting departments could look into, but he's at least the type of talent, former five-star recruit coming out of high school, Maybe a GM somewhere would say we can fix him and he would look better in, in our system than he does their defensive scheme. Yeah, I just I think that there's um I think that there's the Steelers don't necessarily need him at this point either with the uh the 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 
reinforcements they've made on the D-line. Right. I mean, like Keanu Benton looks more like the guy that they were hoping that DeMarvin Leal would be. Granted, Leal was more was always more of a tweener anyways. Like you look at the way that he was drafted, he was looked at potentially as like a temporary ed- edge o- option that can flip between edge and, and the inside, but he needed to get stronger. And at least through two years, it doesn't look like he has. Plus, they've got Nick Herbig now and they don't necessarily need that as much from, from Leal. They could probably get, you know, a guy in free agent. They could probably bring back Marcus golden and the edge rushers are fine. Like last year, there was no need for DeMarvin Leal to do that. Whereas two years ago, there was a need need for him to be there. So that's an interesting move. I I think that with his youth and his size and athleticism, maybe he could get recoup some if they wanted to trade him away. And like they, like they've done with the Dante Jackson, Deontay Johnson trade, maybe use that to move up and around, maybe switch a fifth to a fourth or something along those, along those lines. Uh, But, you know, also like there's other guys on, on the roster, you know, I I agree. Like you TJ Watt, you know, you ain't moving your best player. That's just that, that's, that's a non-starter. Alex Highsmith. I hear the people that, that, that say him and like, they're like, well, just start Nick Herbig. But I'm like, if you trade Alex Highsmith, then the edge rusher position becomes a problem again. And I just don't think you got to draft one. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So like, let's, I don't think that's, that's the move there. I, I just wonder, you know, and not to say that they're going to do this because, you know, one, they need a veteran here and two, it's his contract situation does not let make itself, you know, you, you uh, has, uh, lend itself to making this happen, but it's Larry not an attractive Ogun- contract is what you're saying. <laughs> no, uh, Larry Ogunjobi is, is a guy who like, if you look at the Steelers roster right now, I think he's kind of in an odd position where Cam Hayward's definitely still going to be top dog because he's Cam Hayward at defensive line. But Keanu Benton was a fast riser last year and needs to get more snaps. But Larry Ogunjobi is a veteran and he was solid, but he wasn't he wasn't a big playmaker last year. And this year he's a $13.2 million cap hit. And the problem with that $13.2 million cap hit is if the Steelers were to even just cut him, it would be an eleven point eight million dollar cap hit in dead money, and so it's like you you would not recoup anything by moving on from him unless you traded him away in a situation where another team agreed to eat part of that contract, uh, a significant part of that contract, in taking him on. And that's the one move I think could make a little bit of sense. Um, but even that, if I if I'm another team and I'm getting a Larry Ogunjobi who's you know what thirty years old now, yeah, he's in. He just he just turned thirty. You know, if I if I really need help on my D line, it didn't work, and I didn't think I'd get it in the draft. I, I could see that happening, but then at the same time, like you need to hit with a defensive lineman in this draft class. You know, if they landed Braden Fisk, then I think that this wouldn't be an issue. But um, I just. I think that it that it, it, there is another move coming for Omar Khan, Andy Weidel, Mike Tomlin. I think that this front office is going to do something, and I'm not saying they are going to trade away a player that's on their roster, but I thought it would be very useful to look over the options that would that they'd have that would be the most movable guys to get something back. Yeah, Oak and Joby. I mean, everything you just kind of outlined there is is why I thought they might just cut him before his roster bonus was due mm-hmm. on I think the third day of the the league year and. You could uh, you, you could save yourself a little bit of dead cap hit if you designate him as a post June one cut, and you know obviously he hasn't been productive enough for what you're paying him, but maybe he's somebody who will have a bounce back 2024. I think now that they've you know given him that roster bonus, he probably is going to be in the mix. But yeah, I mean you had the same idea I did, Chris, that you know your D line has some at, at least some guys that you know you'd be comfortable with as your fourth fifth sixth if you did make a move you know other than that they, they've already kind of you know parted with players who I think we would have speculated to be trade candidates early in the process whether that was Deontay Johnson who we, we brought up on the show way back in I don't know I guess it was February at some point before they did deal him to Carolina even the Kenny thing was initially far-fetched but you know once some of the the rumbling started coming out about him you know, not being real on board with the Russell Wilson move, it did make more sense. So uh, other than that, you know, it, it, unless we're really, uh, you know, not privy to somebody who's unhappy behind the scenes or or vice versa, who's a key contributor on offense or something like that, then I, I think it's pretty much status quo. And if you're going to make any acquisition of picks, you might have to borrow from the 2025 draft mm. capital and see what you can do there. That's another option to, to, to consider there. Um, I, I think that the Steelers, uh, 
again, this is the, they're, they, they're, they, they're in a position where they, they still have some significant needs to find answers for that will be playing next year. Like, and I think that's the issue is that like, you know, maybe it is future draft picks to try to address this draft. So that this roster looks, looks more ready. Um, I certainly think that there's uh there's, there's something to be, to, to be said, to be said there. When we come back, we'll talk, we'll have more questions on the, on the Pittsburgh Steelers to add, to answer as far as moving forward. But we want to take a step to look back and see what has set up this current draft situation to have this many needs that and more here on the North shore drive podcast for the Pittsburgh post Gazette, Chris Carter and Brian Backo. But first, we want to talk to you about our great sponsors at Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. When you go to Mike's Beer Bar, they're right on Federal Street, right across the street from PNC Park in the North Shore of Pittsburgh. When you walk in, they're, you're going to see their giant wall of taps where they have over 80 beers on tap. All 80 of those beers are from the local Pittsburgh area, and that's part of 300 local beers that they have, which is part of 500 to- total total beers that they have in stock, and they're always switching new ones in, in and out to get new options. Plus, they have over 20 televisions. If you want to catch the rest of March Madness, the Sweet 16 kicked back off again, and it was... It, it was it was an awesome start to that. If you want to catch March Madness or any sports, but you want to see the the, the Pirates in, the, in their in their start to their season, go to Mike's Beer Bar. It's the, it's the best place to experience it with over twenty televisions. You can even reserve certain TV with your table to make sure that you're getting it. And they've also done some great new renovations on the interior. Go check out Mike's Beer Bar today. You can also get your steak on a stone meal for a great for a great lunch or dinner option there, and so many other things that are available to you. So, so go to Mike's Beer Bar today, and when you get there, tell them Chris sent you. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Chris Carter, Brian Batko, we're coming at you here on a Friday episode. And, you know, we're taking a step back and looking at overall moves here. It's like things have slowed down a bit. We've talked about like the lower level you know, depth veterans that they've signed this week. But, you know, we're, we're also talking about the needs they have right now on the Steelers roster. And part of the reason they have so many needs is because they, they haven't hit on their early draft picks uh, in the majority of their last five years. Now, granted, you know, one of those draft picks they didn't have in 2020 because they traded away from Inca Fitzpatrick, and that certainly worked out. But you look at the guys that aren't on their roster anymore, uh, you know, excluding Broderick Jones from last year. Kenny Pickett's no longer on their roster. Najee Harris is the one guy who is, but Devin Bush didn't work out. In fact, he's a Cleveland Brown now. And Terrell Edmonds, you know, that's three big misses in the in the first rounds in the last for you know, you know, four chances to have a first round pick before before Broderick Jones. Uh, of course, you go back one more year, you get T.J. Watt, and that's a pretty big hit. But even that, even you know, the year before that, you had Artie, Artie Burns. So that's still not the a great ratio for Kevin Colbert to end his career. And I say that saying, you know, acknowledging Kevin Hol- Colbert is a Hall of Fame GM. Like that did that that did not ruin his career. It certainly wasn't a great way to end it, but um, he had he had a great career there. But Brian, I, I think it's safe to say that part of the reason that they have a little bit more positional flexibility is because they're not paying some of the first round contracts like they did in, in the mid 2010s when they had to pay Marquise Pouncey and David DeCastro and Cam Hayward and Ben Roethlisberger and then even other guys like Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell and other draft picks they were hitting on. Yeah. And I mean, you look at this, let's just say it, a, a drought of first round hits and you know, some of them are explainable. Terrell Edmonds late in the, the first round in that year was it was a reach for sure. But I, as I recall that season, there wasn't a glaring need that was obvious. And the, the ones that were probably near the top, like inside linebacker, didn't m- mesh really well with that class that Hidden. year. So and you could have, you know, really taken a, a big swing for a Lamar Jackson or somebody like that. But that would have been, uh, you know, crushed by a lot of critics at the time, for sure. Don't get me started with my Lamar Jackson "what if" verse of if the Steelers had taken him. I have, yeah. I have, I have whole theories on that. But do continue. That that's yeah. I mean, that's an all timer for sure. Um, <laughs> not just for the Steelers, but for a lot of teams that were picking mm-hmm. in that range, considering he's a two time MVP of the league. But yeah, I mean, at, at, at that point, it was hey, let's bring in guys who we can think can help us right now to get over the hump in the final stages of Ben Roethlisberger's Hall of Fame career. So I, I kind of get the thinking, even if I didn't get that pick specifically with Edmonds and the, the following year, I mean, Devin Bush, nobody really had any issues with that at the time. I, no, I guess people if, celebrated it. Right. I guess if you're somebody who was part of that evaluation uh, process with the Steelers, you'd say injuries are uncontrollable. He was never yes. the same after the torn ACL. So that's kind of an extenuating 
circumstance. And again, 2020 didn't have a pick, but the trading it for Minka certainly worked out, all things considered. 2021, Najee Harris is looking like a good player, maybe not the right uh, you know, use of a first rounder at that time. I don't know if you'll see the Steelers do that with a running back again anytime soon. We'll see if they pick up me, his no. yeah, we'll see if they pick up his fifth year option. That's that's a topic for another day for sure as mm-hmm. we get closer to that deadline, I guess it could leak out any at any time now that, that they will or won't. But um, yeah, so I mean that, and then 2022, I've got, at least as we sit here right now, really I've got no excuses. It seems like they misplayed, you know, pretty much everything they saw with that quarterback class that year, yeah. whether it was Kenny Pickett, Malik Willis, Desmond Ritter, just they should have gone into that draft with a completely different line of thinking. And yet, they they would have heard from a lot of uh, a lot of corners of of Steeler Nation had they passed on the Heisman Trophy uh, third second runner up yes. from right next door in, in Kenny Pickett at a time when they needed to replace Ben Roethlisberger. So yeah, I mean it's been a bit of rough stretch, and that'll contribute to mediocrity. And I can kind of get why you know what you were getting at there, Chris, that Omar Khan can you know try to right some wrongs, rip off some band aids, and build it a little bit of a different way. I don't ever see the Steelers organizationally going to the Rams less need F those picks model, but uh, <laughs> you know, clearly the way that they've rebuilt the quarterback room, at least and the flexibility that's going to give them elsewhere, just a slightly different way of, uh, you know, of roster construction and, and partially by necessity, obviously. Yeah, that was, um, uh, that, I think that that's the situation the Steelers find themselves in. And, and part of what made, well, allowed the Rams to do that was they, they had the core that they wanted and they were like, look, we're not planning to have a you know live you know to live for a long time. We're planning to hit right now, and I think you're kind of seeing the fallout from that. Is that you know now their core is you know kind of you know has aged out, and they don't have the draft picks you know to kind of build build forward for them. But you know they're you know they got their Super Bowl championship, so that you know some say what some would say that's worth it. And, and sure, if you look back in some of the years with some of those picks like Terrell Edmonds, you know maybe they could have gotten Shaq Leonard, but you know not not everyone was was saying Shaq Leonard was a first round pick. You know he ended up being a second round pick that worked out for a bit for the Colts before his injuries uh, made made him less valuable in the NFL. Uh, and you could say with Kenny Pickett, they could have picked a, a Trent McDuffie or a Tyler Linderbaum. Um, but I, I think it's less about saying like, you know, uh, shame on the Steelers from for missing here and just more so acknowledging like, hey, like this is the this is the bed they've made, as Mike Tomlin would say. And then they, they've got a lie in it. And I think that's at least so far you've seen the willingness of this front office to be aggressive and fix some of those problems. I mean, the entire quarterback room upheaval that we've seen in one off season, uh, the, the willingness to move Deontay Johnson to get, you know, a Dante Jackson to, you know, signing a Patrick queen to a big contract. They're doing the things that like, you know, I compared this on another show. Uh, but like, if you look at, you know, the early two thousands, there was a lot of moving and shaking to set up the mid two thousands roster that went on to win two Super Bowls. So like, I think that's what Omar Khan, Andy Weidel, and this front office are doing. And I also think like the standards as far as like you know, people are thinking, well, how could you trust this front office to make picks when they've missed so many? This is a whole new front office. Like, like people have said, like, oh, they can't be trusted to draft cornerbacks. This isn't this, these aren't even the same scouts anymore. So, like, and that's you know, they got Joey Porter Jr. last year. Um, and we got some and, scouts are the same, to be fair, but yeah, obviously some, scouts, the, some yeah. scouts, but like, but there's a lot of turnover in the front office, so right. like maybe there's a different outlook on how things are going are going to play out and i just think that especially with the the immediate impact that last year's draft class has happened i think that this group should, deserves the you know the levity to be able to either make mistakes or have a chance to get more hits in the draft yeah and and that's why i mean i think you're you're not seeing a, a completely different uh, plan of attack here you know the guys they're bringing in for pre-draft visits are ones who make sense for the most part Amarius Mims, um, you know, Taliesa Fuaga, you know, clearly some receivers are getting in here, like Ricky Pearsall from Florida. And I mean, we we know the Steelers have to look to those positions to, to get stronger here in the draft, especially early. Michael Penix is an interesting one that was reported from his Washington Pro Day, I believe, this week. Mm-hmm. That he's got one scheduled to Pittsburgh. Um, I was asked about that on on the radio this morning, and I I don't think it makes me any more likely to predict the Steelers will draft him at any point, um, especially in the second round. But I, I just think it, it shows that, you know, they're, they're doing their due diligence on guys who you might circle back to 
later in their career. Look at Justin Fields this offseason. Um, it, it helps to have a file on guys and have a feel for them personality wise, especially somebody like Penix, who being on the West Coast playing in the Pac-12, the Steelers aren't trafficking in those areas and those programs all that often. So to to bring him here to Pittsburgh, get with him in person a little bit when you couldn't send the heavy hitters realistically out to his pro day or wouldn't want to. Um, I, I think that's it's probably more of that. For the most part, you're seeing players who may well be draft picks of the Steelers come through on these 30 visits. But somebody like Penix, it's just it's just enough to remind you that, hey, Andy Weidel, for instance, comes from Philly, where they were always looking to uh, try to hit on a quarterback if they could. All other considerations be damned. So um, also doesn't hurt that Penix ran, what, a four reported four, four, six or something like that in the 40. Uh, that's very interesting. Another guy that I think they should bring in if they haven't already scheduled it is Graham Barton from Duke. Mm. I would want to get a lot of FaceTime with him uh, on the whiteboard, workout, whatever to see. Is he somebody that we're overlooking as a potential option at center? He didn't mm. play it in college. We've got some trepidation from the Kendrick Green experiment, but is Barton somebody who could be uh, a better transition to that spot, at least, you know, down the road, if not year one. Certainly. I mean, uh, Barton also impressed people at his, yeah. at his pro day. That's why I bring him so, up. Yeah. He was moving in those yeah. drills. Arthur Smith was there. That's a, that's a kind of a sneaky good thing about having Arthur Smith as your offensive coordinator. Is I, I believe Pat Meyer was out at Washington's pro day with Troy Fautanu, mm -hmm. uh, the tackle mm -hmm. from there. And then you can get Arthur Smith, who's a no lineman, by trade as well to get eyes and a firsthand look at Graham Barton uh, at mm -hmm. Duke, somebody who you're trying to project to maybe some different spots than the left tackle that he played in college. Absolutely. We'll keep an eye on those draft on those draft moves at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, but we, we got to take one more break. We come back. I want to talk about a back and forth that Brian had in his mailbag recently, and it was around Mike Tomlin and, and his loyalty slash non loyalty to certain players. We'll talk about that here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Chris Carter, Brian Backo, stick with us. We'll be right back. We're back here on the North Shore Drive podcast for the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Chris Carter, Brian Batko, rounding out a Friday show here. Brian, I, I thought it was a funny exchange that you had uh, as you're, you 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 always do a great job answering fans' questions in your in your mailbag, uh, uh, you know, our articles. Uh, but you had back to back questions that you know kind of addressed how Mike Tomlin has handled certain players or just how they've you know that they, they they've sort of panned out with the Steelers and one question sort of talked about how Mike Tomlin, you know, might've been a little too strict or, you know, led to, you know, you know, tough on guys to make them disgruntled to make them want to leave like Deontay Johnson, Antonio Brown, Martavis Bryant, Chase Claypool, Bell, but you know what, In Ingram guys like that. But then on Kenny another hand, <laughs> you can't, can't he pick it most recent one and, and, the, and the biggest one right now. Um, you know, but on the other hand, you know, some people said like, you know, I, you know, I've made observations that he's given two players too much leeway. And so you kind of acknowledge that this is funny. It's like, so he's both too lenient and too strict, you know, if, you, if you're evaluating Tomlin's quote unquote loyalty to certain players. But I do think it's interesting to look at how Tomlin has handled different situations. And part of it is you have to be flexible in how you manage people you know people will talk about chuck Noll. chuck Noll would never give most people the time of day if they were able if they complained but like you know you talk to like mike wagner and guys in the 70s team and they say yeah but he treated terry bradshaw so much more different than like if terry complained about something he heard him out and he would help him in different ways and he would say if i complained about the same thing and i just think it's it's interesting to look at and kind of just take notes on how tomlin has handled different situations with different players over the years yeah, and I'm not saying that he handles everyone correctly. Um, no. I think that's part of the pitfalls of being in any sort of managerial position, right, is you've you've got to have a feel for, you know, dealing with the collective, to use a Tomlin word for sure. I've been listening to too many of these pressers over the last five seasons, but also to deal with each individual differently. And, and Tomlin is on record as saying he doesn't treat everyone the same, but he treats everyone fairly. You could argue whether you know, is that the right way to approach it or not? But I just don't think you can paint him with a broad brush one way or the other to say, hey, um, you know, he he's too much of a player's coach. He's, he's a friend to these guys. He needs to be more of a, a 
Bill Belichick authoritarian uh, type guy. No one's ever accused him or the Steelers of being a militant organization right. the way the Patriots were to the good dynasty of, of the modern NFL. But also then you see guys like Joe Judge go to the Giants and wash out after a year or two because – he was probably a little bit too much of a of a, a hardo on everybody there. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, I think you're also seeing, I, I also get questions often in the mailbag and chats. Why is Tomlin so loyal to his guys like Presley Harvin, Dan Moore Jr.? Uh, a couple years ago, it was Devin Bush continuing to run him out there. Well, that's, that's also not always the case. You know, he moved on from Kenny Pickett after two years. I'm sure Omar Khan had a hand in that. And, and really everybody at the top of the organization had to, collaborate on a move like bringing in Russell Wilson and then eventually swapping out Pickett for Fields essentially but I mean these are just this is what comes with being a head coach he's pretty much seen it all through 17 seasons and I'm not saying everything he does is is right or everything he does is wrong either but I don't think it's fair to to try to paint him into a corner as one or the other all the time and, and the other funny thing about Tomlin is occasionally I'll read the comments on a story like the mailbag or on one of these videos. Every once in a while, someone's on here saying, I never have anything good to say about Tomlin. And I just come on here and crush him every week. And then there are other comments being like, all we ever do is stick up for Tomlin. He needs to be gone. <laughs> so I, I, I can at least sleep well at night thinking, man, uh, I guess I'm doing something right. If I'm getting it from both sides of the aisle like that, I, I think uh, I think I'm also treating each situation fairly as it comes up. And look, there's certainly people out there that don't treat Tomlin fairly or, you know, are, and there's there's certainly things like that. But again, there's things that he's done that warrant criticism, which yeah. we, we address on this show, the Post-Gazette and other places. But I, I just I look at uh, I, I look at, at how, you know, we could we, you could say like, yeah, he's he's been maybe, you know, too lenient on certain guys. But that's part of management. Right. Like, you know, in today's sports world, you can't. Just be militant all the time, and, you know. And even with the Patriots, like that, the reason why the Patriots worked was because Tom Brady was one of the best players that ever played the game of football. If you take him out of the equation, Bill Belichick's militantism is not. It ain't saving nobody, you know. It was just like, hey, we got the best quarterback in the league, and he's under contract. You want to come here or not? And uh, you know, that's that kind of helps that situation. But like, you know, Andy Reid, you know, he's a great coach, and everyone's finally acknowledging, like, hey, this guy's a genius, and he's done he's done some great things. But he just had one of his best players yelling in his face and bumping him on the sidelines, and and like everyone's like, wow, that looks kind of unhinged right there. But you know what puts you know what puts that to bed? Them having the best quarterback in the league and winning and winning the Super Bowl right after that. So like. You know, I think I think sometimes that that kind of thing is overplayed. But like in today's sports world, when athletes, you know, even at the college level, have the have the leeway to kind of just, you know, hey, I don't like it here, trade me, or I'm gonna, I'm at the transfer portal in college. But in the NFL or NBA or you know NHL, whatever, MLB, whatever, players are more independent and they aren't as team dependent to rely on for the rest of their careers they're like you know what hey it ain't working here i don't i don't mess with you you have you have to find the right times to kind of get in somebody's face and like for example i i think mike tomlin did that with george pickens this past year and granted so you could say maybe he should have done it earlier uh but you know george pickens went from you know not throwing blocks and then you know you hear like he, you know after after that the, the colts game where it was very obvious that he peeled back and didn't block for jalen warren in a bad situation there that mike tomlin addressed it and after that, they move forward, and he they didn't do that for the rest of the season. Granted, it was only like three games, but still, um, you know, Mike Tomlin certainly does put his foot down sometimes, but he has to choose when and where and how he does it. And I think that that's where people have to come to a new understanding for what coaching is in today's modern sports world. You don't have the con the, the the control that, like, you know, again, bringing up Chuck Noll. Chuck Noll, if he wanted to, he could be like, I can control your entire life. The, the free agency wasn't what it was back then. You could trade away guys for simply, you know, wanting too much money and put them in a bad situation and mess up their careers. Like, that's not today's NFL anymore. There's, there's so many more people that are looking to make – you know, make moves and get players that players know they're like, hey, if this team doesn't want to give me a shot, I can go somewhere else and, and, and make a place for myself. So it, it's not as simple as just put the hammer down all the time and be the, the, the militarist, uh, the militant, you know, head coach that doesn't take anybody's stuff. Um, but it's also balancing that, you know, that sometimes with being the coach that hears out the players, 
you know, manage their respects. And I, I think the, the healthiest thing that Mike Tomlin does is hold these guys accountable to be adults and be like, hey, like, you know, what? I'm not going to baby you. If you don't want to, you know, show up and do the work, I'm going to go find somebody who does. And I think that's one of the better things that Mike Tomlin does do as a manager of players. Yeah, I do remember thinking last year after the Colts thing that, you know, maybe Pickens should have sat for mm-hmm. you know, a, a series, possibly a quarter, a half. And, you know, that didn't happen. And I, I would say the results proved to be pretty good in the short term. Um, if, if that creates a monster down the line in the long term, then remember I said this and, and we can revisit it. But, yeah, I mean, it's, again, 17 but years. But if it doesn't, ignore it. We don't. We, we never said this. <laughs> no, I, hey, people who watch faithfully know I, I don't mind being wrong. I, I admit that. Nobody's right 100% of the time in this business, that's for sure. But, um, yeah, and then, you know, just like I said, 17 years, Tomlin's seen – a lot. He's had to manage a lot. I would love for him to do a tell all interview someday or or write a book on dealing with Antonio Brown for all that time. Um, (laughs) You know, if Tomlin was, was honest with himself, I'm sure there were mistakes made in addition to a pat on the back is, is deserved for getting the most out of him for as long as he did. So um, these are, you know, they're issues that every coach has to deal with. And, you know, Tomlin's done it at a, pretty high level for a long time to sustain winning we all know they haven't gotten over the hump lately and boy if that doesn't boil down every single podcast that we do why are the Steelers not better in winning playoff games and competing for Super Bowls regularly I'm sure we'll talk about it in some form or fashion again next week Hey, we, I'm sure we will, too. There's a lot more things to break down. We'll see what are the pro days and, and, and draft visits are, are, are lined up for the Steelers as we get closer and closer. But the, the next time that you see us on this show, it will be April, the month of the NFL draft. And we'll, we'll be updating our big boards and giving you more draft coverage of what the Steelers do. And, hey, maybe they make other moves as well. Like we said, this front office has been more has been more willing to make big moves to make changes. We'll address all that here from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Go to post-gazette.com for all our written work. Find us here on the North Shore Drive podcast and all of our different shows on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this channel to get all those daily uh, daily episodes as well as the Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive podcast. We're back Monday with more on your Pittsburgh Steelers right here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all the sports coverage from the Post-Gazette that we have to offer, visit post-gazette.com.